One of the stories is the impact of the repeal of prevailing wage laws. It's really interesting because Wisconsin actually did very, very, very well um, in an analysis that calculated the costs of the prevailing wage laws. And another one I want to get to as well, and that is testimony before the House Subcommittee on Health, Employment, and Labor, uh, the National Right to Work Foundation testified before that subcommittee on what the Biden administration is doing to try to erode workers' rights in the United States. Mark Mix joins me on the program from National Right to Work. Hi, Mark. Hi, Vicki. Good to be with you. Thanks for the opportunity. You betcha. And we're going to start with the good news, shall we? Sure. Let's, if there is any, I think there's a little bit, but yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, there's some good news. The good news is that prevailing wage reform in Wisconsin was among the states that embraced prevailing wage reform um, has actually saved taxpayers substantially and it has given other businesses an opportunity to compete for government contracts where they would have been foreclosed in the past. And I'm looking at an analysis here, and I want to give this man full credit, Ball State University's Michael Hicks, who took a look at multiple different states who had repealed their prevailing wage laws and found, I'll just use Wisconsin here, $15,682 per road mile saved on construction projects, road construction projects in Wisconsin. That one blew my mind, I've got to say. But other states saved not as much, but still saved. So this is a net benefit. More people get to work these projects. More workers actually are on these projects, and we save money. Yeah, absolutely, Vicki. You know, it's interesting that we even have to deal with issues like this. But if you go back to 1931, Congress passed this prevailing wage law, Um, Basically, it was designed to stop uh, African-American black workers from working construction across the country. It was truly a racist piece of legislation. Unfortunately, union officials have grabbed it and they've turned it into really a a, basically a legal price fixing scheme, if you will, to basically say that non-union companies can't participate, can't bid and can't do work on construction projects that are under prevailing wage laws. Well, as you mentioned, from 2015 to 2018, six states took advantage of the opportunity at the state level to pass what is basically a repeal of the prevailing wage laws that existed in their state. And Vicki, this Michael Hicks study from Ball State, basically he admits that he comes in, you know, kind of in the middle of studies that have indicated what the savings can be on projects that are under prevailing wage laws. And we found like the Boston Big Dig, the Boston Big Dig up there went, you know, 30% over budget. It went like two years over time schedules. And that was one of these prevailing wage project labor agreement uh, construction jobs that just was huge. But here, I mean, saving $15,682 per road mile of construction, that's money that the government can use for other projects, other things, or maybe this, they could return some of that. Yeah, we're we're seeing the government try to use this to bail Milwaukee out of its bad 115 years of bad management decisions. Be nice if the dollars could be remitted back to the taxpayers. But that's huge, huge, huge. It was predicted to be large. And by the way, we also got rid of what are called project labor labor agreements as well. Um, And when you got rid of, I think that's probably why we had a more substantial savings. That was saying, um, you know, if you're a non-union company, you're going to be paying union prevailing wage and you're going to have to, you know, functionally act as if you're a union shop for the purposes of participating in this particular project. Well, no, no company that was non-union could possibly do that. So they didn't. Yeah, that's right. It, it eliminated. Well, look, if we look at just the statistics, excuse me, of construction workers that are in unions, I mean, basically 85, 86 percent of all construction workers have chosen for whatever reason not to be in unions. And they would be they were basically blocked and prohibited, frankly, from participating in those jobs and having those small construction companies compete or bid on those jobs, which you know, as we know, Vicki, when you have monopolies, you prices tend to suffer and and certainly taxpayers suffer when you allow a monopoly to operate when it comes to taxpayer dollars. Oh, we had overruns, overruns yeah. all the time because, of course, the companies that controlled the, the cartel, the labor cartel, um, would bid and then change order, change order, change order, change order. Next thing you'd know, I mean, in in this sector for road construction, um, just a couple of years ago when we had an audit, we were routinely 100 percent over budget. 
I mean, routinely. So um, with the change, uh, we are now starting to actually see real dividends being paid back to taxpayers uh, for these projects. I mean, we were, we were staring down Republicans getting behind a gas tax increase because the cost of road construction was so high, said the cartel. Um, we've managed to uh, to resist that. that so that's excellent. Um, and I would encourage everyone, I'm going to post, post this so you can read it. I want to get to the bad news. And the bad news is basically the Biden administration is trying to undo protections for workers, whether it is um, decertifying unions, whether it is the secret ballot process that you're supposed to follow when deciding whether or not to establish a union at your your workplace. I mean, from what I'm reading from the testimony that was given before before the House Subcommittee on Health, Employment, Labor and Pensions, um, it's kind of a wholesale assault across the board by Biden's radical uh, pro-union labor labor folks at the NLRB. Yeah, absolutely, Vicky. And and it really is an amazing transition from the four years under the Biden, under the Biden, well, the, the two, through two and a half, three years under Biden and the four years under Trump. I mean, interestingly enough, the National Labor Relations Board in 2018, I believe, was passed what they called the Election Protection Act, which basically enhanced and granted and restored what rights that workers had regarding elections for union certification. And it basically said, we're going to let workers vote. We're going to let them vote. And the preferred method is obviously secret ballot. Well, that was too much for organized labor. And frankly, when you give workers a little chance to exercise their rights, they tend to do so. And, you know, we can't have any of that in the Biden administration because the most pro-union president in American history self-proclaimed, actually not most pro-worker, but pro-big labor boss, president in American history, has decided they've got to change that. And they got to go back to the days when the NLRB would rule that because the employer said something or because the employees didn't do something right, they will block any attempt to get out of a union. They certainly won't block any vote to basically put a union in, but trying to get out is a whole other story. And that the hearing under Bob Good, the chairman of that subcommittee, I think was really informative for most Americans who As you mentioned at the outset here, Vicki, these are issues that don't get a whole lot of attention. But the idea that workers can exercise their rights under, unfortunately, a federal law that goes back to 1935 that allows the federal government to control all private sector labor relations across the country. It was very refreshing to hear some voices there talk about the injustice to individual workers' rights. Well, and it's high time. I guess there's this is the third rail. How many third rails do we have? There's so many third (laughs) rails. But, you know, this is supposedly the third rail. We've had Republicans and free people who claim to be supporters of the free market, um, who claim to want to shrink government, who claim to want to, you know, give the individual citizens more power, had an opportunity over how many years to alter the National Labor Relations Act to instead of having the NLRB, the board, vote in the election protections to have it actually be codified in law so that someone can't come in is a different administration when the board flips and decide workers' rights don't matter any longer. Yeah, that's exactly right. And there is, there's legislation, legislators are starting to talk about it, but Vicki, as you know, you follow this and I want to say, you mentioned third rail. I don't think Vicki McKenna has any third rail, but anyway, (laughs) that's another story. But yeah, they're talking about that of, of taking away some of the authority of the National Labor Relations Board. For example, you have a general counsel at the NLRB that has unreviewable discretion, unreviewable discretion when it comes to issuing complaints or denying complaints. And certainly this NLRB general counsel, who happened to be a Communication Workers of America former union employee, a lawyer, is basically deciding, you know, putting your thumb on the scale and saying, you know, if you want to get the union out, I'm not as interested in a complaint, but if you want to put the union in, have at it because I'm more than willing to allow you to move forward on that stuff. But unreviewable discretion for a body that adjudicates individual employee rights when it comes to labor law it doesn't make any sense, really. No, it's, it's I mean, it actually sounds unconstitutional. It sounds it, it, it sounds like a machine to me. Um, it doesn't sound like something we're supposed to have in America. Um, you, you mentioned Trump. Trump was not anti-union. He but he had a, a rational sense when it came to labor relations. And 
you know, he wasn't anti-union, but he wasn't anti-anti-union either. And so we actually had workers getting a fair shot there for a while. Fairer. Uh, you can't say fair with a deep state. But here we are with the Biden administration trying to impose by fiat the PRO Act, which is to take apart independent contracting. I mean, a, a whole bunch of other things. The union unions apparently think that they can scrape, s- claw back some of their lost ground if they can completely abuse independent contractors. They want to get rid of the secret ballot, universal card check. You see that happening as well, where they're trying to impose universal card check, which is eliminating the secret ballot. And it goes on like this. And you're, and you're kind of thinking, these are big, big questions. And nobody's out there talking about this at all. This could make it very, very difficult for workers to have access to the flexibility and the opportunities that they have come to, you know, kind of rely on here. And is, is maybe that's the point. Maybe everybody needs to be on the dole because they won't be able to find a job. Yeah, Vicki, it really is. You know, labor policy, when you read the flowery language of the preamble of, of uh, Section 7 of the National Labor Relations Act, it, it talks about all these rights that employees have. Well, frankly, since 1935, actually 1937, when the Supreme Court upheld uh, the constitutionality of the National Labor Relations Act, even though they had struck it down in 1933 when they tried, when Roosevelt tried to pass it then. And, and uh, if it wasn't for a threat to pack the court, I think it still would have been ruled unconstitutional. But here we are. And the flowery language says the employees have all these rights. But frankly, what it's turned out to be is a cartel of big business yes. and big labor. And the employees have nothing and no standing and no rights at all. And that's pretty clear from the actions of it- not only the Trump NLRB, but the Obama NLRB and you know, name the president. Yeah, it used to be that it was management and ownership that would abuse employees. That's what it used to be. And now it is big labor bosses that abuse employees. I mean, there was you go back and read the conditions of working in the United States in 1915, and it's awful. Well, guess what? That's not what we're dealing with now. Now the people who want to abuse your rights are the people who claim, who say, look back to 1914 and how horrible everything was. I'm the reason things are great. No, they are, they are standing on the shoulders of people who did good work to protect employees as they abuse those same employees so that they can fill the coffers of political campaigns. And it pisses me off. <laughs> Well, you're absolutely right about that. The idea that organized labor, you know, tries to make claims to representing workers and then uses strategies and tactics and legal proceedings to block them from having yes. elections, to force them to sign card checks and block them from, you know, certification elections and decertification elections. That's not the type of representation that uh, one should should be promoting as being, yeah, we're standing up for employee rights. They're standing up for big labor rights. And it's so easy to see. I mean, the examples are getting more prevalent all the time. And frankly, Vicki, employers have cleaned up their act in a very dramatic way, not only because of regulation, but because they know that it, in order for them to be successful, they have to have employees that are successful. And so the idea of the of the you know the Industrial Revolution in 1890 and the 1900s, and you think about Henry Ford in, in 1918, he was offering you know eight hour work days, and he was offering as flat wages for people and beating wages for other companies by you know double because he knew. That if his workers were happy, they first of all they needed to buy the cars they were manufacturing. But he said if they were happy, he would he would stop turnover and have to stop the all the retraining and the cost of going with that. I think employers are sensitive to that now. There are a few out there that are not, but we have labor laws that allow workers to hold them accountable too. But ultimately, this law is being used by organized labor and big labor officials and uh, politicians to basically feather their nest politically, and that's really what it's come down to. Indeed. Um, please check out the piece, but well, we'll make this one linkable, um, the piece by, by Mr. Hicks from Ball State. And then you can also go to nrtw.org. Um, you can actually, you know, sign up for a newsletter so you get information about all of this stuff that is happening. Mark Mix, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Vicki. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful weekend.